Welcome to The Deep End with Jeffrey Barron and Jeffrey Casuto. All right, Jeff, what do, we got, uh, what do we got on schedule for today? Let's just rehash a little bit for our audience who didn't get any sure. of the behind the scenes information. Our creative director, after listening to some of our uh, previous work, advised us that we should stay away from scientific topics because we don't know what we're talking about. I believe he used the term schmucks. So our creative director advised us to, to stay, stick with what we know. He, he heard us talking about viruses and uh, arguing about whether viruses were going to be the end of humanity or not. No, don't you remember we had a very, very uh, intense discussion about the fact that you think cellophane is natural because man made it and therefore it's natural. Listen, you brought in cellophane to muddy the issue. Not muddy the issue. It's a very I didn't come in and say cellophane is is natural. No, oh, so now you're saying it's not natural? No. Oh. Why are you saying that I'm saying that? I don't know what you're saying. Stop putting words in my mouth. Uh, well, I don't know what you're saying. That's my point. You don't know what I'm saying. Exactly, because you don't say anything. So say something. Who's the moron now? Exactly. Is cellophane natural or not, Jeffrey? It depends on your definition. No, no, of no, natural. no, no. I'm asking you, Jeffrey Barron. Is cellophane natural? It depends on your definition of natural. This is why people hate Jews and lawyers. No, no. You're assuming that there's one definition. I'm asking you. I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah. And I believe that there is more than one definition of the word natural. Which would you like me to use? So what you're saying to me is you don't know. That's what you're saying. But I'm asking you a simple question. Cellophane. Natural, not natural. It's not a simple question. It is a simple question. You're just avoiding the answer. I'm pointing out that there's a distinction. There are different ways to define the word natural. You're refusing to accept that. You're insisting that there be only one definition. At the end of the day, your answer is you don't know. Don't, don't be afraid to say that you don't know. Don't be afraid to say that you don't know. Listen, asshole. Natural can be defined in a couple of different ways, all right? There's a traditional definition of natural, which assholes think is the only definition, and that is like grass is natural. And anything that looks and tastes and smells like grass, that's natural. And anything that's not like grass, anything that doesn't grow from the ground or hang from a tree is, is unnatural. No, I mean, fish don't hang from a tree, do they? What about genetically altered fish? Are they natural? No, because there is a process that man had to put his hand in. What, what if he puts his penis in it? All right. Honestly, honestly, this is when this is where you get when you don't really have an argument. And look, this is fine. You want to talk about penises instead of, you know, nature. Is peanut butter natural? Is it organic or is it skippy? No, not skippy. I'm talking about organic. Yes, it is. Peanuts yes. that are crushed. Yes. yes. Next okay. question. How, and how do peanuts become peanut butter? Is it a natural process? Oh, what you're saying. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying that if I make a stew. Even though everything, all the ingredients in that stew is natural because it came from the ground or the tree or beef or whatever, the fact that I'm taking a little bit of beef and a little bit of vegetable and a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and there's a process, then therefore that creation has to be natural. Well, isn't man's hand in that? Yes. Yes. But, and you, but I thought you said if man's hand was in it, it's not natural no, anymore. No, no. Look, no, that's what you said. Y you're right. I, that is what I said. However, so then if I don't. Man if because the, the end result still, the, you know all the ingredients and where they came from. All the man is doing is taking them and putting them together. Right? When Wait, you isn't that in vitro? Yeah, and I, I look, and we had this discussion too, and I said that the process of in vitro is not nature, right? The baby. So then, what is you're natural. saying, right? So maybe natural is a bad word. Maybe natural is a bad word. No, no. no. I, I'm extrapolating nature. what it's, you're it's saying. Let me nature. finish. Nature. It's you, nature. Nature. Not natural. Nature. Because natural is a watered down word. You know, we've been calling food natural for years, and they've been it's been processed. So that's bullshit. It's not natural. Okay. If you can find me like a honey nut Cheerio growing off a tree, you know, then we'll have another discussion. But natural, I don't like nature. Nature. Let's talk about nature. Okay? All right. So you're admitting that everything that you've said about being natural is wrong. No, because we're... Do you want to change I'm, the subject now? No, it's not changing the subject. It's clarifying the subject. We're talking about 
nature. Nature. Okay. What's your point? My point is when I was saying, when I was using the word natural, I was using it uh, under the auspices of nature. Okay. Not like that would whether, make sense. Yeah. Well, it would make sense. Well, not according to you because there are so many different, you know, definitions of natural. Idiot. There All are. Right. Okay. Honestly, I want to punch. And, I'm, and there are just as many definitions of nature. Uh, yeah, and it there are many definitions of every that. word that we have in the English language, and it's just amazing to me that we can even communicate with one another with you know with having all these definitions that we. Well, agree we can't with. actually. There's a lot of miscommunication. Yeah, there is. That's like, a right huge here. problem. Honestly, I'm gonna I'm gonna punch my computer right now. So just what's the next subject? Honestly, you're kidding me. Uh, after all that discussion, uh, our creative director said we should stick to what we know <laughs> and not talk about things like science. So we pretty much decided, didn't we, that we would talk about the origins of the universe and what, if anything, preceded the universe, where it came from. The answer is it didn't come from anywhere. It's an infinite past as much as an infinite future. But what about the Big Bang? The Big Bang exploded out of nothing. Isn't that the theory? It was, well, yes, sort of out of nothing. I mean, at the point that it it actually exploded, I believe that it was literally a dot, like the, the smallest of particles. And all the mass that we see around us today and in our universe was all crushed into that one little singularity. But now that's not nothing, clearly. I mean, that's, that's something. I mean, my question would be, where did that fucking thing come from? I mean, that doesn't answer any questions. I would think that it would come from another, you know, the big crunch, like the big crunch before it. And it's just kind of like maybe an infinite series of big bangs and big crunches. Isn't that one of the theories? Yeah, I think it's actually uh, the theory of uh, the guest we're, we're going to call in today, Edward Tryon. And Mr. Tryon's going to, what, he's going to answer some questions for us, you think? Unless he hangs up on us uh, immediately, which honestly... Who is Mr. Tryon? You know, why don't we tell our guests who Mr. Tryon is? Because we're going we're gonna to actually give him a call right now. I am familiar uh, as of today with his article from 1973 posing the question of whether or not the universe is a vacuum fluctuation. And on that note, let's give him a call. Um, he's fucking really smart, and hopefully he'll pick up the phone. Hello? Hi, Mr. Tryon. Yes, speaking. It's Jeff Barron here. I thought it might be. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? A bit, uh, a bit weary. Are you able to talk? Y- yes, so I won't be at my best. That's okay. You know, even though you're not at your best, I'm, I'm sure you're still leagues above myself and my colleague here. Well, um, thank you. And by the way, my name is Jeff as well, and it's uh, very nice to meet you. Uh, can I call you Edward? Uh, I'd rather uh, prefer Ed. I never cared for Edward. Okay, Ed. From what I understand, the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light, or at least the space between matter. Is is that the prevailing theory right now? Uh, I, I I don't think so. Mr. Trine, is it correct that eventually the universe stops expanding and will begin to collapse? That's one of uh, one of the two possible possibilities in the uh, general models for cosmology. But uh, in recent years, there's been uh, evidence that the universe uh, will not come to a stop and, and then collapse. That there is not enough uh, matter to exert the gravitational breaking force for that. And indeed, uh, if there if there is uh, vacuum energy. It may be that the expansion will speed up uh, as well as uh, lasting forever. Now, if that's the case, is, are we supposed to assume that, that this is like a one-time deal? I mean, because it, then I guess it can't repeat. Well, we don't know of any mechanism for bouncing back from a contraction. It, it, it had been conjectured uh, when I was a student a uh, half century ago. A bouncing universe was one of the things people uh, thought about, but... Uh, there has never been an adequate explanation for how it would bounce back from a contraction. And there is uh, not appear to be enough uh, ordinary matter breaking the expansion to stop, to stop the expansion ever. You know, we, we both uh, read your uh, article on vacuum fluctuation. You know, on a quantum level, there could be particles that just appear and then 
destroy each other and that's it and it's in a moment it's in a moment yes or not destroy each other if if the net energy of of the matter that just appeared is zero and i i suggested that the particles might appear with sufficient negative gravitational energy to cancel their positive mass energy and then per- persist forever your theory uh, of uh, vacuum fluctuation where is it today it remains the only uh, conjecture ever made about uh, how a universe could appear from nothing. I'm curious to know like, where you were when you came up with that. I was in the audience of a seminar at Columbia University where I was a junior faculty member. Our speaker was a, an eminent British um, astrophysicist and cosmologist named Dennis Shama. I had done a calculation as a graduate student at UC Berkeley which I thought had uh, must have some significance. It was a relationship between Newton's constant of gravitation and the density of matter in the universe and the, the rate of expansion. Uh, and I've been trying to make sense of that uh, for uh, two or three years. During uh, the lecture by Professor Shama, he paused at one for a half minute or so to look through his notes. And the room was silent, of course, uh, politely silent, when I amazed all of us by blurting out, maybe the universe is a vacuum fluctuation. The audience, which contained three Nobel laureates on the faculty at Columbia then, burst into laughter. And I was left with the difficult decision of letting them think I was wonderfully amusing or letting them (laughs) know that I had been serious. How do you think the, the, the theoretical physicists as a group behave? Are they a bunch of animals, or are they, you well, know... Well, I'll venture this for you. It's much less a, uh, in my personal experience, it's much less a brotherhood uh, with and, and sisterhood of uh, people with shared interests and a and, uh, uh, happy family. Um, <clears throat> there is fierce competition between different departments and a powerful class class structure. There are much less much more likely to cite someone at a prestigious, powerful institution like, like Harvard or, or, or Princeton or Caltech. Uh, those people are much more likely to be cited for their contributions than people at small departments without prestige uh, in the field. Sounds like typical a- academics. Well, yes, but I was young when I started learning this, and uh, <laughs> I had not... In, in my Midwestern naivete, I had not expected it uh, mm-hmm. to, to be so gruesome. Okay, so let's take the, 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 your theory of uh, vacuum fluctuation. There's been no experiment created to test this theory. So my, my question to you is, is it physics or metaphysics? Is it physics or is it philosophy? Well, that's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, uh, By the way, uh, there is uh, enormous experimental evidence uh, that vacuum fluctuations involving some particles in some circumstances take take place. The the quantum fluctuation uh, gained a great deal of plausibility when Guth explained how a microcosm could automatically inflate to a macrocosm. That made the idea more credible. These experiments in a vacuum, I was curious to ask, how can you be certain that the vacuum that you've created for your experiments is an accurate mimic, for lack of a better word, of the vacuum that existed before the Big Bang? Oh, I, I, I can't. You're, you're asking uh, very insightful questions. Uh, every theory raises new questions. What was the state of nothingness in which your fluctuation occurred? And I will look you in the eye and say, I have no idea. You know, I guess, I guess you can say that the fact that religion is so pervasive in our society is an indication of how much further you guys have to go. You know, once you guys answer all the questions, then finally that'll be the end of religion. What you, you know? I, I doubt that. I doubt that. No, I think I that's exactly it. right. Religion fills in the holes that science leaves open. That is correct. But the reason why my religion is science is because science builds upon itself. The Bible has been the Bible for over 2,000 years, and it has not changed. Well, that's the nature of science, and that's the nature of religion. Let me ask you, Ed, were you, uh, what was your reaction with the, the Higgs field? I wasn't very excited simply because I fully expected it to be found. Do you know that today they said they found it, finally? 
Oh, oh, I didn't know today. I thought they had, they were saying that months ago. No, I think they were 99.9% sure months ago. Oh, but today, oh, well. they found it at 100%, they said today. Oh, okay. Well. Yeah, <laughs> we're all throwing a party. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, um, Ed, I, I, we really appreciate your time. Hold on. I have some more you, questions, Jeff. I have more questions. Fun, I'm sorry. By the way. <laughs> oh, great. Then you know something? We had, we got another hour in us. I had some questions for you, Mr. Tryon. Feel free. I'll be pleased to hear them. You went to Cornell, right? Yes. And then? Berkeley. Berkeley. California, right? Yes. You, what years? I entered in September of 62 and left Berkeley in December of 66 on my way to uh, driving across the country to Columbia. Now, that was an exciting time, the 60s in California. Especially at Berkeley. Were there drugs going on, you know, within the departments there that you were involved in that may have assisted you guys with some of your theories? <laughs> uh, <coughs> multi-layered, uh, multi-layered question. <laughs> <laughs> You're not under oath. Uh, is there a statute of limitation? <laughs> yeah, there is. You're free. Absolutely. Just about everybody smoked a little grass now and then. A, a few people did acid. Uh, well, I, I personally know of one, and I re- remember it quickly because I shared a small house with him and because he nearly killed himself. He was home alone when he tried it and told me the next day that he had come very very close to committing suicide. Wow. Well, that that's a good now, reason not to do it. I would assume like a lot of these things like marijuana or LSD – that they could be helpful to a point to inspire new ideas and thinking outside the box? Well, the LSD will give you new... new. <laughs> I, I've never had it, but uh, to, I wouldn't put marijuana and LSD in the same sentence together. They're so utterly... Well, I, no, no, I, of course I, well, not. Listen, I, think Jeff's, I think Jeff's point is that it's, it's not that it com- you come up with a theory, you have this revelation. Well, with the LSD, you uh, might. I mean, they see things that have never been seen before. They have, you know, other, oh, you know maybe, and maybe that's a new layer of reality, but I doubt it. it and I think that that's what Jeff is getting at, is that it's just an expansion. Maybe it's an expansion of their imagination. And, you know, Einstein, you know, it was all about imagination. And yeah, without it, I'm, you know, we would, not, we would not have the theory of relativity. By the way, for the record, I think pot and acid should be in the same sentence together if you have really good pot. <laughs> yeah, we, we, <laughs> we didn't. I, I had... I had very, no, you very guys had dirt meat back then. And it didn't do, didn't do much uh, for me. Oh, I, I, I shouldn't mention him. There's a very famous physicist whose name is surely familiar to you, who was my best friend at Berkeley. We did a little grass, very little bit. But I'll tell you something funny. We had heard that morning glory seeds uh, could also give you a high, and they were legal. This person and I went to a, a flower store, gardening store, and bought a few packets of heavenly blue morning glory seeds. <laughs> <laughs> and we munched those that evening. We went to a, one of the early James Bond movies, and then we went back to his house and uh, we munched the morning glory seeds and got, and an hour later we're vomiting on the front lawn. And the next day we looked at the fine print on the package the seeds had come in, and it was a uh, remark that something that will make you sick had been enclosed to discourage people uh, consuming. Them. See, that's not well, nice. Memories, well, you know memories. something? Well, the thing is, is that you did the experiment and proved that they were correct. Well, it was well, very scientific. Well, but I... I <laughs> that, was, that was Stephen Hawking you were eating the morning glory seeds with? No, it was Leonard Seskind who won the, won the wager with Stephen Hawking. Have you met Stephen, Stephen Hawking's? I think it's Hawking, not Hawking's. That's correct. I've attended a lecture of his, but never met him. And, and what was the lecture about? Was it about uh, black holes, or when was it? When? 20 years ago, uh, for a general audience at Rockefeller University. What was the exact date? Do you remember that? I, I, have, I have no idea. That must have been, a, it must have been quite, a, uh, quite an experience to... Uh... I admire the man for his courage and his perseverance, and I have long uh, had many reasons to believe that the, that the popular media had greatly exaggerated his significance and his brilliance. When, when he was young, maybe in his 20s or so, he had expressed the view that if the universe ever starts contracting, line, time will start running backwards. And I thought, that is, uh, I can't believe that this, this man believes that. You know what he said that I, I didn't care for recently? He said that, you know, he's certain that there's nothing after we die. And I, I thought that was, he was a little bit too sure about that. Well, that's not within the field of physics. 
you know, I, he, he's a hero to uh, people in, in many fields, but he's no, not remotely the best theoretical physicist in the world. I, I think we can all agree that he's just a moron. He was able to uh, publish books about these very sort of complicated uh, uh, areas and make it accessible to the layperson. Remind me of the name of the, his first book. Brief History of Time. I think it was the least rewarding book for a general audience in physics I've ever read. Secondly, uh, you can read the book without having heard any idea or theory attributed to anyone else, except except perhaps his personal uh, research uh, associates and assistants. I have to say I liked a lot of the book, but um, I was definitely confused. What would you recommend as a better, more accessible book to a general audience um, for sort of a mind-blowing a book on, uh, you know, theoretical physics, the history of time, the universe, etc. I'm, I'm sorry to say I um, can't, can't really make suggestions. Um, and you don't need to. When I was young, I would have recommended... Uh, QED? Oh, I, I'm not familiar with that book. That's Richard Feynman. Oh, oh, Feynman. I've read some of his work. I like it. People have praised his course uh, on his quantum lectures, and I've read them, and I didn't find them uh, at all helpful. Have you ever read QED? No. I, d- I didn't know there was such a, a book. It's fascinating. Uh, at least for me, it was. Well, it, it's my impression that he's more f- fascinating in his writing for a general audience and clarifying. And I, I read part of his uh, published uh, lectures for an undergraduate course, and he, his, expl- his conclusions didn't follow from the explanations. They were always interesting, um, lively, um, but I, I, I could uh, uh, could not avoid thinking of other explanations for his conclusion than uh, than than he had offered. I, I, I he certainly had many gifts, but um, I, I think he's overrated in the popular media as well. Um, were you extremely smart as a kid? I mean, were you much smarter than than all of your peers? Forgive me for. Um, for, for being candid, yes. I studied less than virtually anyone. Um, I earned six varsity letters in three sports in high school, three in baseball, two in basketball, one in tennis. Being an athlete, did that save you? You know, because usually you think of uh, kids who do really well in school as getting, you know, beat up a lot. Yes. So did you escape that because you were an athlete too? In elementary school, there were two students who had been held back a year, who both beat me up once or twice, but uh, uh, only briefly. But mostly it was um, people feeling socially awkward around me. I I was extroverted, and uh, people thought I had a good sense of humor, and everyone uh, knew who I was, but it was hard to get uh, close to people. I, you wouldn't have guessed that I that I had the mind that I had to watch me interacting with others or watching how I spent my spare time. I'll share something to remain. Um, I mentioned that my father had his master's and Ph.D. by age 23, uh, Phi Beta Kappa at University of Chicago. Smart he guy. Also, also put a handgun to his forehead at the age of 38 and uh, kissed the world goodbye. Sorry to hear that. I'm curious to know what, looking back now, what impact you think your father had on you in the subsequent years as you developed your theories and, you know, became, you know, um, really invested in physics. You know, did he leave you with a positive, you know, motivation or? I I was 12 when he killed himself. That's rough. Yeah. Um, He took my brother and me to his uh, chemistry lab uh, two or three times and, uh, showed us amusing chemical reactions like pour one clear fluid on top of another and suddenly it becomes a rainbow of colors. Um, and while we were uh, nuclear testing in, in Nevada, uh, he brought home a Geiger counter one day, this was in the winter, and he showed us that the snow in the backyard was radioactive. Um, he was an ardent um, rifleman. He was <clears throat> treasurer, secretary treasurer of the Wabash Valley uh, Rifle Association, which sponsored several 22 caliber rifle matches a year. And uh, that was an interest he shared with my brother and me. At that time in Terre Haute, the uh, YMCA had a um, 
a rifle range in the cellar for 22 rifles. I sometimes carried a rifle to elementary school to carry down to the YMCA after school. Um, my older brother uh, had a measured IQ of, uh, let's see, I think 130. My, my mother told me that, and my mother told me my father had his IQ measured at 135. I think my mother may have suggested that she was the first girl he had ever kissed. That had some plausibility. He was two or three years ahead of himself from kindergarten through high school. And that makes boy-girl relationships really, really difficult. It, it's not easy for a man as smart as my father to uh, find good and lasting company. My mother was a wonderful woman in, in several respects. Um, but it, just, it was not going to be a happy marriage and, and wasn't. Well, show me the way to the next whiskey bar. Oh, don't.